Hello everyone and welcome to the next uh, edition of the sales webinar series uh, here at the Center for Professional Selling at Ball State University. I'm your host Deva Rangarajan and today we are continuing with part two of the interview series that we had with uh, the chief uh, strategy uh, strategist at Gainsight, Ruben Rabago, as well as uh, uh, the chief customer officer Ashwin Vaidanathan uh, and we were discussing in part one of the video we were talking about their new book uh, which I recommend is a definite read for those of you interested in this new function of the customer success professional so thank you gentlemen again for uh, taking the time to talk to me and the audience thank you for having us our pleasure thank you for having us Indeed. Indeed. So in the first part of the webinar, we were actually talking a little bit more about this new function of customer success. And we talked about how customer success, yes, it's a new function, but an organization needs to look at customer success as a kind of philosophy, as a kind of strategy. And then based on that, understand that this role is going to help us achieve that as well. And then we talked a little bit more about what kind of a professional is this person, what kind of skill sets and mastery should they have. And for those of you interested, I strongly recommend you to go watch the first part of the interview. But we talked about that and, and we kind of left off with saying how the customer success uh, role should stay positive, especially during difficult times and everything else. So now we actually want to move further along to actually see what, uh, how would you go about operationalizing customer success in a firm? So yes, you have a very clear view and a vision of what customer success should be for my company, why it is critical, what kind of roles do I need to have? Now let's talk about how do we make it happen. And, and so here we want to talk about this. And I want to talk about chapter six, uh, where we talk about preparing for the engagement with your customers. And here I like this idea of you need to have a 360 degree view of the customer. And here is a question that I get asked a lot. And I try to muddle through the answer when I talk to my, when my participants, but help me out with this because usually when we talk about CRM, customer relationship management, again, as a tool or as a philosophy, the idea is we need to have a 360 degree view of the customer. So the question I always get asked is if that is how you define CRM, why do we need to have CSM? So can you tell us a little bit more about this idea of 360 degree view of the customer, but more importantly say why CSM is much more than just CRM? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a first step, Ashwin, and then you can uh, layer on top of that. Yeah. So, so CRMs um, by default are amazing mm. at collecting data. Yeah. I mean, you can throw a thousand yeah. different fields on there because they're important at that time and maybe they're important at the time of sale which is really sort of the mm. right the, the where this was born out of or it was it's really important at the time of solving a very tactical support issue mm. right so you sort of have uh, this massive amount of data what isn't great um crms um are surfacing the most important information for the type of engagement that you're, you're delivering. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you sort of see this perspective of, you know, the 360 view, uh, 360 mm -hmm. degree view of the customer, it's really about contextual view of the customer. Mm -hmm. um, and so making sure that that data is actionable at the time that it makes sense, um, or that the system surfaces information that leads you to action as a portfolio manager of customers. Mm -hmm. Ashwin, any additional uh, uh, context you'd like to provide there? Um, the only other thing to add would be uh, the way we think about um, delivering customer success, it's typically like three, uh, if you think about a CS maturity within a company, there are three parts to it. Part one is getting insights about your customers, which is customer 360 view, just like you called it, or a CRM. Um, step two is now that everyone in your company has access to the same customer 360 or the information about customer, the insights about your customer, how can you take consistent actions across different functions um, that are customer facing? Um, CRM falls short of that process because the workflows and the outreaches that are dependent on the customer 360, it's the it's almost like the so what of the data. Um, that is where we see as the next level of maturity. And you can extend that into the third level, which is the more transformative stage where even your non-customer facing teams 
are making use of the customer 360 to make better decisions. An example of this could be your product team saying, I launched a, a beta feature, X customers were actually able to use it. Let me analyze it. Is it because healthcare yeah. is doing really well versus some other company, et cetera? Um, that's one example. Finance teams uh, creating mm-hmm. forecasts based on mm-hmm. Customers that mm. paid late last year are mm. at a higher risk of churn this year, yeah. right? Like those are the types of insights that you can then start drawing. And that's like the next level, which a CRM doesn't do for you. So that's how I think about it um, in that maturity model. Well, thank you very much because what I've been muddling through when I talk to people that ask me this question has always been about the fact that th- th- CRM, if actually done at the same way you define CSM, if it's seen as a philosophy in a company, is supposed to be doing all this, right? But it's still focusing on 360 degree view, which is mostly based on marketing, sales, and service. But I like your answer where we say, but a CSM, when you try and take a look at it, should also be looking at, let's say for example, if you have your own workflows and design thinking uh, ways for product marketing, how can we try and use that? If you wanna try and uh, look at it from the viewpoint of how accounting and finance can be used and feedback from there can be used into this. And that for me is actually, if we say CRM is also a philosophy, then of course the idea is that 360 degree views, how do I take care of my customers but drawing insights from the other functions not necessarily seen in CRM, would what make would what would make CSM really where it is, and that's what I think is a very nice uh, way of looking at it. Because for me, when I look at 360 degree view, because I'm so conditioned to the idea that CRM is still a philosophy, which is again getting a 360 degree view. Now, there's a difference between getting a 360 degree view and having it, because in most companies you have the silos thinking where marketing does not talk to sales, does not talk to customer service. Now, I'm not talking. I'm talking much more from the viewpoint of the overall view, but then taking an insight, that's what I also like from what you said, taking that insight from the other functions and then making it into a co- coherent approach towards my customer. That is what I really, really like, which is a nice segue into the next chapter, which is what I really enjoy as well, chapter seven, because I think that's the first chapter I read. Forget all the other things, which is actually looking at customer journeys, because there's a whole idea that people now are talking about things like design thinking and everything else, but design thinking from a commercial perspective and everything else, right? Tell me about this because I get this, asked this question all the time. There's one thing to segment your markets for the sake of marketing. Do you gentlemen consider segmenting for the customer success organization different from the way your organization is looking at segmenting its markets? Ruben, you want me to take it? Yeah, why don't you take this one, Ashwin, and I'll jump on. Cool, okay. Yeah, I mean, the ideal state, um, Deva, is having a unified segmentation view Mm. across Mm. the entire company. Mm. Um, Not like in in the real world, that doesn't always happen because in some companies, (laughs) sales has a higher political clout in the company. They have Mm. a, uh, like what ends up happening is if sales is determining the, segmentation uh, perspective mm-hmm. then uh, or marketing is then the view is generally towards the buyer journey and not the mm-hmm. customer journey mm-hmm. right so which means it's typically based on um, revenue that mm-hmm. is available or um, potential revenue that is available mm-hmm. in the future etc it's less about like the actual or if marketing does it then customer demographics or firmographics mm-hmm. and all of that need based segmentation come into mm-hmm. the play um, what it misses are like the majority of the customer that you're talking to, yeah. right? Like how quickly can they actually find value in your product or service? Uh, if you work with customers, then you have certain indicators yeah. or health scores related to your customers about how well they are adopting or yeah. how well they are deployed, et cetera, which should all factor into that segmentation process. Yeah. So the long-winded response to your question is <laughs> ideal is one one med, yeah. like segmentation across the whole company. But if not, I would still recommend CS leaders to create segmentation profiles that best serves how your customers want to be dealt with. I think that's an excellent yeah. answer. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that, but Ruben, I'm sorry for interrupting because I think it's a very pragmatic answer because there's one thing to say, this is how ideally how it should be, it never happened. So I still get asked the question, is market segmentation different from customer portfolio analysis? And I always say, there's a difference between ABCD customers as against 
this vertical or firmographics and things like that. And my understanding is this, there are two different things, but in your business, it also depends upon what and how much importance is given to the customer towards these kind of functions and how much they want to invest in you as well. And that's something that is critical. And I really love the answer. Sorry, Ruben, but for me, I, no, I was, I was just going to sort of simplify it, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, honestly, like how the customer gets yeah. through the funnel yeah. doesn't matter. What matters is what happens like after they get through the funnel. Exactly. Right. So yeah. um, because ultimately from a CS perspective, I'd like, like yeah. put the, the CS lens on. Um, it's what you do with a customer once they've like signed that contract mm -hmm. and have committed their time and energy Absolutely. to select you over, over the competitors. They want to succeed. Their expectation is to be like the most successful customer uh, you have ever had. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about, um, you, you know, irrespective, you could have 15 different, you know, methodologies of getting a customer. They may all, you know, 20% of them may look and behave this way and they may have come out of three different sales segments. Indeed. So, um, you know, so you really want to focus in on to, to Ashwin's point, the customer journey. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the critical piece. And in the world of SaaS, that's the long sustaining uh, uh, effect of your customer. Indeed, right? So, but then would you also say that, uh, not to prolong the point, because I really think that segmentation is going to be critical for the success of your CS efforts as well. That's my opinion. Uh, but I think where would you put in the willingness of the customer to invest their own resources? Because it's one thing for them to say, we're going to do buy this, because they would have gone to any fancy university and they would have heard the term customer success. So what, what we're going to do, we're going to create that. Going back to the point, to what extent do you think alignment of philosophies is also going to be critical for you to say, you know what, this might not be a big customer, but this is a customer that we want to showcase because we align in our strategy. So it's kind of like key account management, but this is key customer success management, right? So what are your thoughts on that one? Those kind of things where just buying a solution is not enough. It's how much they're willing to invest and use it. And it's part of their philosophy towards their customers. Yeah, so this this on some level comes down to you're asking a couple of different questions in there, Adeva, and and one of them is you know qualifying the customer mm -hmm. um, yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, measuring the customer's uh, success, mm -hmm. right? Um, companies talk and they love talking about you know vetoing uh, a, a customer. The bottom line is most companies aren't going to do it. You're gonna you're gonna grab a logo when you can get an opportunity mm -hmm. to to close that deal, and so it's a matter of knowing to what effort and extent you're going to have to take with that customer once they've come through that funnel. And it's about measuring whether or not they're, how ready are they and what obstacles, what measures do they not have uh, for the variables of success? Do they not have a designated mm -hmm. administrator? Do they not have, Indeed. you know, X, Y, Z set up? Is their data um, not in good health, right? So these are all the things that you probably fish out um, as part of the, the sales discovery, um, what sadly happens is a lot of that data stays within the sales cycle. Yeah. And what's really important is to carry that data through uh, to, the, to the organization that's fundamentally Indeed. responsible for their long-term success. Indeed. Ashwin, I'm sure you have a, a perspective uh, on that as well. No, I think you covered it, uh, Ruben. Um, I think the the... Uh, qualification processes right and like I think the general uh, benefit of doubt that we have to give buyers or customers is that they they want to make the product successful like yeah. they're they are invested in making it successful um, most of the time companies tend to or product vendors or services vendors tend to be their own worst enemy mm -hmm. if you don't reach out to the decision maker and tell them that someone in their organization is not moving as fast as they originally envisioned mm -hmm. or that you would want them to move. That's on you. Like you should be proactive on in making sure that happens just because you get blocked by someone in IT at a customer. Don't stop there, right? Like that's, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. and, and like, these are things that actually CS professionals can learn from sales professionals. Sales has been 
breaking down barriers for ages for decades now they know exactly yeah. why and when to be persistent and they could teach the cs professionals a thing or two about um being persistent and finding creative solutions yeah like i I'll, I'll give you like a super tactical thing and which i'd love to talk about uh that i learned from one of the best sales guys i, I had ever worked with and i was just saying you know god my my contact sort of you know, has ghosted me. They've gone radio silent. I can't get in contact with them and they're not responding. Their renewal's coming up and I'm, I'm sort of freaking out, you know. And he says, um, connect with him on LinkedIn and just every once in a while, like their post, make a comment. I mean, and then he gave me at least like a half dozen of these tactics yeah. that, that they use to Ashwin's point, right? So I, I think there's a lot that uh, we could learn from the sales motions. Because you're right, Ashwin, they've been doing this for, for decades. Yeah, and I keep going back, and I'm, I come from the sales domain, and I always say being proactive is something that salespeople can learn from you guys. So, so when, when you guys are talking about customer <laughs> success, but actually your point uh, is, a, again, a nice segue into the next one where you talk about, yes, it's nice to have your customer journeys, but of course, how do you then make sure that you operationalize on it? And especially when you take a look at moments of truth. And here specifically, I like one of the things, which is actually a business reviews, right? So one of the things you talk about is the business reviews and stuff like that. So essentially, tell us a little bit more about typically what goes into a business review meeting that you have with your customers. So I know that you have the QBRs and the EBRs, but typically what gets discussed there? Yeah, I can, I can maybe start and Ruben uh, chime in. Um, the first thing I'll call out is people call it EBRs or executive business reviews, hmm. but most of the time executives are not invited to that session and or like there isn't good content to keep the executive engaged so they will definitely not join the subsequent ebr that you set up so thing and also like typical ebrs tend to be like 60 to 90 minutes long yeah. Yeah. and no most execs don't have that kind of time to invest mm -hmm. in these types of forums so um what we've uh, we've also evolved our thinking along EBR. So the current thinking is it needs to be a progressive EBR, which starts with maybe 15, 20 minutes of even inviting the CEO of the customer that you sell to or a CRO or a, like get as many senior people as possible. And you talk about big trends that are going on in the industry. It could be moving to subscription, what are companies doing in terms of best practices, et cetera. Very little, you should try to pepper in your product, but it's yeah. at a higher level than like, what are you using in the product versus not? Mm. That's not something the CEO of your customer cares about. Mm. Um, they care about like, what are their peers doing? What are they missing out on? Um, those are the types of topics that they care about. So if you, one, get an executive, two, if you're getting an or multiple executives, make it worth their time and talk about things that they care about. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the session where they could choose to drop off or they could choose to continue, talk about pushing the agenda on, here are things you get value from, like get credit for things that you are delivering yes. to the customer, both outcomes and experiences. Mm -hmm. And then also talk about what else they could be doing to accelerate momentum using your product or service. And then also then like part of your uh, CSM's role is also to be a salesperson in selling the vision for the future. Mm -hmm. And so you are doing X, you could be doing Y with things that are in the product and wait for it. If in the roadmap, we have these four other things that are coming that are just going to change the trajectory for your company, right? So like there is all the reason for you to double down on working with me as a vendor or as an, as a service provider. Um, and like the goal of that session should be to get multiple stakeholders across the hierarchy pumped up about um, yeah. not only grow, like extend, like investing in your product or service, but also like going the extra mile and uh, being pumped up for the future. Yeah. I think this is, uh, this is really, really cool, which means that one of the things we always talk about, when, especially when we talk about key account reviews, I'm not talking about EBRs or QBRs, we talk about how you need to take a look at the customer's uh, annual reports, uh, what are they saying? Because I hear the same thing coming up in what you're saying is that do research about your customers, bring in insights. And I, it's what I'm hearing is that at what point do you actually even envisage that within the customer success function, I think you come to it a little bit later on, that you might even have a customer success 
divided role between one who's more customer, you know what I mean? One who's more commercial in their focus as against one who's much more technical data analytic kind of stuff of thing. Okay, this is what we're seeing. Am I making sense out here? Uh, because from what I'm saying is that you're actually talking about a kind of a commercial role, right? In terms of saying, setting the stage, where do we want to be uh, doing the research before and all that kind of stuff. If you look at if you look at customer success as as a, a functional role, so as a as a yeah. CSM, right? Um, ultimately, their charter is to make the renewal event a non-event, <laughs> and to make sure that the customer is set, right. So, as yeah. a CSM, ultimately, you are already pivoted mm. towards making sure your customer is going to push whatever envelope they're at as it is. Hmm. Um, you're not just going to sit back and say, oh, I got a green customer. I'm hmm. fine. Right. Um, in fact, you're going to, you, you are likely encouraged to accelerate on your green customers. And so the EBR is actually an opportunity uh, for you to partner, I think is sort of where you're headed towards, hmm. to partner with uh, your sales team. If your CS uh, and your company has, uh, mature to the point where maybe you split that functional role mm -hmm. um, and you have an individual um, who could be reporting up to like the CCO yeah. um, or could be reporting up to sales um, who is responsible for the trans for the commercial relationship yeah. uh, of those transactions mm -hmm. and then your CSM you know in that sort of like post sale role uh, or post initial sale role serves almost like a built in uh, sales uh, consultant or sales engineer uh, in the traditional sense of the word. So uh, Ashwin, you have a, a other thoughts around that? Uh, it, I mean, like I think every CSM, regardless of whether your compensation is tied to commercial activities mm -hmm. or not, I mean, at the end of the day, you need to make your company successful as yeah. well, right? Like, so uh, like the common saying, every one of us, is selling all the time, mm -hmm. um, whether you call it selling or not, yeah. um, and whether you get compensated for it uh, or not is a separate issue. Um, but um, everyone is, and like I think whether you are uh, directly responsible for the commercial conversation or not can depend on how complex your product is, yeah. um, yeah. how mature is the industry you are selling into like if if you there's several highly technical complex products where you need a product expert and you need a commercial expert and like the csm could choose to play one of these two roles uh, and you could call the other person the sales role um and so right so there is a place for each every type of um, role combination i love it which brings us to the next one. So essentially you're having your EBRs and one of the things you will probably bring up there is try to bring up the health score of the customer or your decision to have or push for a, a meeting would be much more based on the health score, which is a term that I found very interesting when I first came across this idea of customer success because health care, I viewed it as a kind of much more of a lead indicator than waiting for later on, waiting for the end and say whether we're going to have revenues or uh, you know, renewals or not. So tell us a little bit more about this idea of a health score and more specifically, you break down your health score in line with your equation, which is you have a health score with the experience and you have a health score with the outcomes. So tell me, tell us a little bit more about what that is, please. The general idea, health score is like such an, a debated topic. If you're, <laughs> if you're remotely in the customer success world, like you at some point debated health scores. Yeah. Um, so so what we said was based on just like, there is no uh, a single answer that satisfies every use case possible mm -hmm. in every industry. So we decided to put some prescription together that should work for 80, 20, 80% of cases. There'll mm -hmm. still be lots of use cases that doesn't satisfy this mm -hmm. yeah. uh, format or framework. It's mm -hmm. a framework, right? So treat it as such, not a gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so um, in that framework, what we are saying is if to deliver outcomes, there's typically Again, like multiple ways to think about it. If you sell licenses or if you sell products, if those licenses or products haven't been deployed for the first time, there is no way there is a conversation about adoption or value. The first yeah. step is just deployment. Yeah. So understanding and including that in your health scoring, which we call as a deployment score, is the first step. Then 
once you've deployed, you want to then make sure that people are using the product in both the mm. depth. If you sell licenses, then the common usages like monthly active users, yeah. daily active mm. users, etc. Yeah. Right? Like what you measure, like that's one measure. But also, if you have multiple features and a, a customer is contractually entitled yeah. to multiple features, yeah. how many features do you use? The more features yeah. you use, the more stickier you yeah. are internally. And the uh, more outcomes a customer can get yeah. because they're using multiple parts of the product. So that's the adoption piece. Mm. Um, the third one is then like along this journey as customers yeah. are adopting, there are multiple yeah. personas or stakeholders yeah. at your yeah. customers. Are you engaging with all of those stakeholders mm. at the right point in time? And then finally, if you do all of these leading activities and indicators, then ideally your customers get the outcome that they want from your product or service, which is the ROI. Piece. <laughs> so we said there is deployment, engagement, adoption, and ROI, which together make up for the outcome score. Then you've got the experience side of the house, yeah. which is NTS or customer satisfaction, or if you do customer yeah. advisory boards, are people attending those yeah. events and contributing mm -hmm. to it? If you host and mm -hmm. if you have training, online training, are people tra taking training courses and all of that good stuff? Gives you an idea for whether there is experience benefit coming out of your engagement yeah. with your customers. And so both of those put together, you can get a good sense for whether customers are getting outcomes and experiences and then take the right action if one of these two are missed. Wonderful. So if I understand you correct, it's almost like the customer's journey. And in every stage of the, depending upon how the customer goes, it could, if it's a complex uh, integration, then you're going to have a different point in time at, at, at three months, you're just going to be looking at onboarding or deployment. So you've got to take a look at health score based on that particular stage. And then in every right. stage, as you go, you're going to come in and base on that. So essentially, if you have different customers in different stages, then you need to uh, I look at the appropriate kind of health and outcome uh, scores, health scores in line with where the customers, you know, it kind of reminds me of a funnel when you deal with salespeople, essentially yeah. from that viewpoint. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting, but of course it's slightly different, but to draw parallels to, if I were to explain this to a bunch of sales managers about why it is important to have customer success, I can draw parallels to how they manage a funnel saying, the more number of people, the more you advance, you have different kinds of metrics to see whether you're going to have a sale or not. In this case, that once you, if you do this all, you should be having the recurring revenues or, you see what I mean? Or multiple subscriptions or your cross sell and upsell. So very, I, very I, I, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's really totally, important to, yeah. sure. I was just going to Sorry, say, I was just going to say, Ruben, <laughs> ahead, to the funnel, yeah. funnel yeah. point. I think it is exactly like a funnel in that Customers who come out of onboarding, if you measure health during onboarding yeah. or integration, customers that come out of onboarding in a positive green health are more likely to yeah. adopt and renew. Indeed. If you're red, then you are not going through that funnel to the next level um, in that sense. So you yeah, could, that you could you drop parallels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I think that parallels, what I was going to add too, Ashwin, is right on, is um, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the, why do you do health scores in the first place? It's, it's about elevating the level of revenue predictability. Yeah. Right? Indeed. yeah um, absolutely. And, 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 yeah. and so, right, I, in other words, I want to know yeah. six months ahead yeah, of the fun. renewal yeah. whether or not this customer's trending positively or negatively. Yeah. Because if they're trending negatively and they're my high, one of my highest paying customers in my portfolio, my attention is going to immediately go to them. Indeed. Right. Why? Because I want to be able to predict my portfolio's revenue. Yeah. Right. And so, so uh, in, in that way, your, your, your parallel is spot on. Devin. And, and your, it's also spot on because I think I love this idea that at the end of the day, each one of a salesperson is looking at prospects and seeing if they're going to close. In your cases, you're already on, but the question is just because they signed on does not mean that they're going to come back again. You have to go through this again uh, and look at Are they going to renew? Or are they going to buy more? Or are they going to leave? Indeed. Right? It's like, it's one of the three. Yeah. Right. Awesome. This is really, really cool. So yeah. here's my question. The next thing that you have, the next chapter that you have, which I think is very relevant, you talk about using technology to manage the customer success delivery process or things. You call it tech touch, right? So especially one of the things which I get a lot of questions, again, for people who come up to me and say, hey, we have this customer success. What are we going to do? We have these bottom tier customers who are 
important because they could go on to become bigger customers later on. But should we be having high touch or you know what I mean? That our customer success doing these kind of elaborate things. So you talk about tech touch, especially what I like is for the low for the low touch customers. So tell me a little bit more about how do you manage these kind of customers where you have to use technology to manage them and how do you go about running this uh, setting expectations with the customer about what they should expect and things like that. So let, let me start and then I'll certainly let fin, uh, Ashwin uh, finish is I want to break a myth yeah. that tech touch is not only for the SMB or for the low paying customer. Yeah. Tech touch yeah. um, absolutely can be used. Um, I almost like a bot as, as uh, an amplifier um, uh, and in a way a, a, a something that bolsters and augments uh, the CSMs that only have maybe even a handful of customers. Mm -hmm. There are still things that that CSM uh, or the company wants to convey at scale uh, to that segmented uh, uh, group of users that um, uh, you can absolutely leverage tech touch uh, uh, with. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I want to, I sort of want to sort of, sort of set that aside um, that it's not like specifically yeah. for uh, any particular uh, uh, segment Small. of okay. High, okay. high or low. Indeed. Well, but sort of, it sort of makes sense because you could always think about, uh, again, drawing parallels. We think of e-commerce, e-commerce and EDI should not just be for your price conscious customers. It could also be for your key accounts where they're doing a lot of repeat purchasing and stuff. So I like this idea of how you try and take a look at tech touch to based on what the customer is looking for. Love it. And then, yeah, and then the, the, the next thing is really, um, you know, there's really finding uh, a way to be informed yeah. um, through the lessons learned from customer marketing marketing um, of how much you are able to tailor the message to the customer, to the scenario, to their health score, yeah. right? And and leveraging all of those those data yeah. elements in a way that um, really um, uh, mm. feels very much like a personalized message, um, mm. I think um, elevates the level of of, of success you might yeah. or won't have. You can actually turn people off with too much tech yeah. touch yeah. Um, if it's too generalized or not applicable, if it's mm. not resonating, um, it, it, it just start becoming spam. Forget it, you've lost your customer mm. in, in, in that way as well. Mm. Ashvin, do you have anything else uh, sort of related to Deva's original question? No, I think you captured it. It's yeah. uh, like the way to think about it or the framework that, um, that we've thought of is that Every customer segment has a combination of human element and digital element. Yeah. It's a question of for your high touch customers, it's 80, 20 tending towards human and 20 on digital. For the SMB customers, it's 80 on digital and 20 on human. Mm. And so, and all your other segments are somewhere in between. So that's the way to think about it. Uh, right. Everything is a combination. Indeed. Now, one of the things which is actually, I'm going to move to one of the last chapters in this particular segment is where you talk about driving revenue growth through engagement. Right? And there's one aspect, there's a lot of wonderful nuggets there, but one I think is very interesting is you talk about stakeholder alignment, right? And I, from a, even from a sales perspective, sometimes it's so hard to get stakeholder alignment. Uh, so what are your thoughts on how should a customer success manager go about trying to get stakeholder alignment where sometimes you're gonna have contrasting needs uh, between the members of the stakeholders. Am I making sense? So one person might be looking at one set of uh, performance outcomes they were looking for, another person will be looking at other things. They may not agree between themselves about what is good or not. So how would a customer success manager deal with these kind of complexities? Like the most common thing is like at some point, uh, and maybe that common point is the CEO and smaller organizations, but these conflicting stakeholders roll yeah. up into someone who yeah. rolls up into someone who rolls <laughs> up into that's right so yeah. uh, at some point there are there is someone who cares about the trade off between these conflicting priorities mm -hmm. and so stakeholder alignment if done right needs to engage someone senior from your organization with someone yeah. senior who can make these trade off decisions at the customer and then bring these up to say we are hearing conflicting points in terms of priorities in the next three months, what is truly important to you? Yeah. Um, and what is truly important to the, 
decision maker is generally very different than what is truly important to people who are actually executing Learning, it on a basis, right? Basis, right? That's exactly and, yeah. Yeah. So it's and very I, important that yeah. we keep both in mind and absolutely. we have like plugs into both of them. Indeed. But the key is not and I think the other base sorry. Yeah, I was going to say the other baseline um, and maybe it's implied but I just want to state it outwardly um, is that you can't just be connected to one executive decision maker at your customer because ultimately that uh, it, it, it'll happen uh, that executive will leave maybe you've made them so successful that they go get a bigger job right or maybe yeah. it didn't work out for them right mm -hmm. what's what's the average tenure of a, of a seed yeah. level right and so you know if you're looking at five six ten year uh, relationship you can't be tied to just one executive so from the very beginning um, I would put it on sales to establish those connections from the very beginning of the relationship um, and, and to help sort of uh, expand uh, and, and, and grow those relationships. If you only received one executive, it's on you to, to, to grow that. Indeed. I, I think it's, it's an excellent point. And I think the more I hear this, the more I actually see so much similarities, but at the same time, distinctness in the customer success role. But I think it's like one of those things where uh, the more I hear this, the more I can easily see that uh, good salespeople need good customer success managers. And I'm a firm believer that in many industries where it's not necessarily SaaS, where they do not have a customer success role, I don't care what you call it, but you need to have that role because salespeople today just do not have the time to go back to their customers and check with their customers if they're getting the value that they need and the other functions don't really care. Marketing is not vested in them and neither is service because service are much more interested in implementing it, solve problems and get away from there. So I really think that when I take a look at this, that this is truly, if you were to form the idea of sales enablement as a concept, this is a, an essential and an integral part of sales enablement. I, I'm not saying that it is just sales enablement. What I'm saying is that if the idea of sales enablement as a philosophy is helping the, getting renewable sales all the time, this is such an integral part of it. And I think in the interest of time, the last part of the book was more along the lines of retaining and uh, developing the best CSMs. And I think uh, one thing that uh, Ashwin said already was a factor that yes, you have your you need to compensate your team, but you also need to make sure that it's going to be held against KPIs, but the KPIs you have to take into consideration your business. What is the status of the business at this point in time? I really like the example you gave. And I think you also talk about how you need to measure them with lead indicators and lag indicators and how they have to be held accountable based on that. And I just want to draw a last point, which is actually one of the things we say in sales all the time is that just because you begin in sales does not mean that you're going to end up in sales your career in sales. And you talk about having career paths in customer service, but what interested me much more is, can we have in the future, one of the things you say is that having a career path for customer success into other roles within your company. Because I remember there used to be a time when we would talk about 80% uh, uh, of the uh, Fortune 500 CEOs were in sales at one point of time or the other, right? Do you envisage something somewhere in the future where you're going to have a lot of people who have to proceed to becoming CEOs that customer success is going to be part of it as well. Yeah, we, we've already seen it happen. Yeah. Uh, 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 Chris Comparato from um, Toast yeah. uh, was a, uh, came out of the C, a CS yeah. uh, uh, Functional, line, yeah. right? Functional role. And um, uh, it is something that uh, I remember uh, hearing Dan Steinman say, state on stage uh, as a prediction uh, like five years ago. Yeah. You know, he says, I stand here and I predict that uh, there will be a C -C -C CCO that will elevate um, to the CE yeah. role. Yeah. And um, it, it, it won't happen. Maybe Ashwin's next gig uh, is going to yeah. be a CEO uh, somewhere. Any, so. Any, any. <laughs> no, I, because, uh, no, but I, I really think it's from the viewpoint because we always say when we explain it from the viewpoint of sales, we always say sales is the point where you're actually touching your customers, but you're also interacting internally. By that yardstick, customer success is also doing it, right? And 
for me, from that viewpoint, plus you have things that the sales manager does not necessarily have. You might need to have project management skills. You might need to have account management skills. And you, who knows, you might even need to have data analytical skills, which are things that normally you don't associate with salespeople. But if you have all this, plus the ability to have a conversation with the customer, I think it would just be normal. Uh, I mean, not normal. You, should, you would expect that it should be easier for a transitioning of a customer success uh, executive to go on to become a CEO of a company. Yeah? Exactly. I would also add like to the list that you mentioned, like product knowledge, yeah. which is also so natural yeah. in um, to the mm -hmm. CS uh, leaders. Yeah. And so that also adds to it. I think it's also a function of uh, today. We don't hear of too many Chris's at Toast because the the number of CS leaders is yeah. much smaller than the number of like sales so leaders CD, or CFOs, right. you know? Yeah, right. And so like once this profession like gathers momentum um, and like there are many more CS leaders, we'll naturally start seeing the benefit of, um, of, CEO, of CEOs coming out of that profession. A natural thing that I'm already seeing right now, by the way, is way more than I've seen um, in like the years past is CS leaders are now starting to manage product teams. So mm -hmm. CS um, leaders are either combining product teams and CS teams reporting into the same person, um, or they're shifting the roles um, to take on the product teams, which is like a really good indicator. Like those two make up for such a big part of um, employee count in most companies anyways, between engineering product and delivery um, that it, like I can see that the next natural step for some of those people could be CEOs or COOs and, and you, for sure. Yeah. And, and if you think about it, right, the marriage is the only way you can truly scale mm. is through product, mm. right? Um, so if you find a way to build in all the things your, your CSM is doing and continue to close the gap and you build it into the product or you ask the question outwardly, mm. why is a CSM having to do this? Is it because of a product gap? Well, let's go close yeah. that gap, right? And so you're going to gain scale that way. And if you have a CSM that is really informing uh, that roadmap, um, you you gain scale really, really fast. Um, and it's uh, it, you, you can't have one without the other. Absolutely. So folks, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to our audience. Once again, for the audience, the name of the book is The Customer Success Professional Handbook. Again, I cannot recommend this book strong enough. It's a fantastic book. I'm going through this and I'm looking and getting a lot of tidbits, tuggets, and this interview also really helps. So thank you, gentlemen, and good luck with your book. Good luck with Gainsight and great, wishing you great customer success. Likewise, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Deva. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Bye.